So let's start off by differentiating enzyme induction from competitive inhibition. Now what's nice is that we can do this with just three words. The three words that you should use for enzyme induction are increased drug metabolism. And conversely, for competitive inhibition, the three words would be decreased drug metabolism. And remember that metabolism is occurring at the level of the enzymes. Now the reason this is so important is because now we're starting our discussion of drug interactions. Drug interactions. And these are a unique type of drug interactions. These drug interactions are secondary to, 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 secondary to, changes in enzyme activity. So why are changes in enzyme activity so important? Let's not forget that one enzyme, and that enzyme, if we remember from the last lecture, is CYP3A4, is responsible responsible for more than 50% or is responsible for the metabolism of more than 50% of drugs for greater than 50% of drugs so if I increase drug metabolism or I increase the number of enzymes as in the case with enzyme induction or I decrease the number of available enzymes our free enzymes with competitive inhibition, we just know right off the bat that that's going to affect, that has the potential to affect 50, the metabolism of 50% of the drugs available out there. And so these types of drug interactions, to some degree, are unexpected. And this is unlike the drug interactions from pharmacodynamics. So let me just write here, unexpected. Now remember with pharmacodynamics, we're dealing at the level of the receptor. So those types of drug interactions are somewhat more predictable because we can say, oh, here's one class of drugs that likes to work at this receptor. Here's another class of drugs that like to work at this receptor. If I give them together, I might get too much of that effect. That's a pharmacodynamic interaction. Here we're dealing with pharmacokinetic interactions and specifically on the metabolism portion of pharmacokinetics. So this is why understanding the core concepts will help you greatly. And the first thing we're going to do is talk about enzyme inducers. So how do enzyme inducers, let's, yeah, let's continue our blue. How do enzyme inducers increase drug metabolism? Well, the answer is simple. Enzyme inducers end up making more enzymes, plain and simple. This is happening at the you know, genetic level. We have a signal that goes to the nucleus. It tells the body, hey, let's make more enzymes. And the first example we're going to do is with chronic alcohol use and acetaminophen. And so we'll start off with somewhat of a clinical example. Let's back up a second. So here we have this question, why do we get this warning? And this is a bottle of Tylenol, also known as acetaminophen, and we see that as the active ingredient right here. So let's zoom in on this. Here's acetaminophen, and we see that it's a pain reliever. And if we scroll down just a little bit, we see this alcohol warning. What does it say? If you consume three or more alcoholic drinks every day, ask your doctor whether you should take acetaminophen or other pain relievers or fever reducers. So this is a totally legitimate question that a patient can come to you saying, hey doc, this is on the side of my Tylenol bottle. I have three cocktails every night. What should I do? And why is there some sort of drug interaction? And that's what we're gonna start off by understanding. You know, That's what we're gonna start off to, to understand so you can answer their question. So, chronic alcohol use with acetaminophen. So we'll start our discussion by looking at this graph here on the right. And on the 
x-axis, I have the plasma concentration. And on the y-axis, I have the rate of drug metabolism. And this is that standard enzyme kinetics graph that we saw in the previous lecture and that you've probably learned in pharmaco or in biochemistry. Remember that the first part of this graph shows first order kinetics. That's the rate of metabolism is proportional to the plasma concentration. The second part of this graph shows zero order kinetics. It's independent. But that's not what we're talking about. Here we're talking about enzyme inducers. So what happens when I make more enzymes? Well, I'm increasing drug metabolism. I'm increasing the rate of drug metabolism. So if I was going to draw that graph, it might look something like this. And the way we differentiate enzyme inducers from competitive inhibitors is that the predominant effect is that we see an increase in this maximum rate of metabolism. And we call that our Vmax, the maximum velocity. And so the Vmax is pretty much where we get this plateau right here. So this is the new Vmax. And so by understanding this graph, we can see what happens. At any plasma concentration of a certain drug, we see that the metabolism, or the rate of metabolism, is occurring faster. We're, we're metabolizing more of this drug to get rid of it or whatever. And so there are two effects that I want to talk about. So this is the <laughs> this is the whatever that I just said. So enzyme induction. What are the two effects? These are somewhat obvious. Well, the first effect is I'm increasing the rate of metabolism. So when you metabolize drugs, what do you create? Well, you create metabolites. So enzyme induction results in increased metabolites. And we hope that those metabolites are non-toxic. In some cases, though, they are toxic. The other result of enzyme induction is really the flip side of increased metabolites. If I'm increasing the number of metabolites, what's happening to the drug concentration? Well, the drug concentration is decreasing. Decreased drug concentration. And that is, these two are the most important things that you should take away from this graph. So let's get back to my example over here. So one of these enzyme inducers is chronic alcohol use. So chronic alcoholics, what's going to happen is that they are going to make more enzymes. And by making more enzymes, they are going to increase the rate of metabolism. So they are going to metabolize acetaminophen. And one of the metabolites of acetaminophen is toxic. And so this ends up in creating a toxic metabolite. Now note, only a minority of acetaminophen metabolism makes a toxic metabolite. Some people say it's about 5%. But if I'm taking it with chronic alcohol use, I'm making more of those enzymes which metabolize acetaminophen into a toxic metabolite. And under normal circumstances, I can break down or get rid of that toxic metabolite as quickly as I'm making it so it doesn't cause problems. But with enzyme induction, I'm making metabolites at a faster rate than I can get rid of, and that can lead to hepatic toxicity. And so we've dedicated a whole future lecture to acetaminophen toxicity because it's just such a ubiquitous and frequently used drug. Now the next example might be more relevant to all the ladies out there or to a doctor treating a lady. And that example is anti-seizure medication with oral contraceptives. Now we've talked about an anti-seizure medication before and we talked about it because it had uh, it quickly reached zero order kinetics. And that drug we said was phenytoin. So a patient who's taking anti-seizure medication is taking it for a long period of time. They're taking phenytoin. And let me just make a note here. It also reaches zero order 
kinetics quickly. So a patient taking phenytoin is going to increase the amount of, so increases the amount of CYP3A enzymes, that family. Now one of those drugs that might be broken down faster as a result of that are oral contraceptives. So you tell me, if I am increasing the metabolism of oral contraceptives, what happens to the drug concentration? Well, I can have a decreased drug concentration. And as a result, the, I'm not getting the adequate doses of oral contraceptives that I might need, and I would become pregnant. Uh-oh. That's no bueno. That's not something that we would want, unless we're planning on it, of course. So this is an important example. Now notice the similarities between these two. We are, you know, enzyme induction occurs when you're giving a drug not one time, but over a repeated number of times. And it's our body's physiologic response to either help us get rid of that drug by increasing this enzyme. And many times, there are many other drugs that are also metabolized by that enzyme. And that's why these side effects are unexpected, because these are drugs of two completely different classes. Who would have thought that anti-seizure meds would interact with oral contraceptives? Now the next example is something we see on a more global scale, and that is rifampin with HIV meds. Quick question. What percentage of the world is infected with the tuberculosis bug? Now, I'm not saying actively infected, but let's just say latently infected. If they would have a positive PPD, or that little test where they inject that thing on your arm. Well, the answer to that question is surprising. One third of the world has a latent TB infection. One third of the world, all right? And tuberculosis is incredibly common in patients who have HIV. It's in those, it's in, you know, some one of the top causes of death in people with HIV. And let's not forget that 34 million people in the world have HIV. It's the number one, uh, you know, infectious agent that leads to a single infectious agent that leads to death in the world. So now we say this patient with HIV, which is very likely to get tuberculosis. So they're taking rifampin. And rifampin is an enzyme inducer. And therefore, what's going to happen to the level of HIV medication? Well, we're going to have a decreased drug concentration. Now, similar to you know, the concern with antibacterial drugs, there's also some concern with the HIV medication. A person is infected, you give them drugs at a certain dosage to avoid viral resistance, and often we give multiple drugs. And in this case, if the decreased drug concentration, we might see treatment failure, we could even see possibly viral resistance evolving. Resistance. So it's something to think about. So if you're giving rifampin to a patient with HIV meds, what might you have to do to the level of HIV meds? Well, you might, one, have to increase it, or two, switch to an HIV med that is not metabolized by an enzyme that is induced by rifampin. Now, in our last example, we're going to switch things up just a little bit. So here, instead of starting a enzyme-inducing medication, we're going to stop an enzyme-inducing medication with another medication. So this med is called St. John's Wort, and it deserves a little bit of a side story. St. John's Wort, by the way, wort is the English or the old English term for for plant. This is uh, an antidepressant drug that has been shown to be pretty effective in treating depression in relation to some of the other you know, uh, standard depression medications. And there was a big Cochrane article in 2009 that really showed this. But this is an also an over-the-counter medication, or an over-the-counter herb. 
And so this was really the start, arguably, of herb-drug interactions. This is one of those reasons that doctors started asking patients, do you take any herbal medication or over-the-counter medication? So let me just make a little note here that St. John's wort is used for depression. So if I, let's just ignore the stop here for a second. If I was using St. John's wort with allergy medication, uh, that would decrease the drug concentration, right? But now imagine I've been taking St. John's wort for a while, and I'm also taking allergy medication. And my doctor says, hey, you know, there's some interactions with St. John's wort with allergy, medica allergy medications. I think you should stop that. So if I stopped the St. John's wort, instead of having a decreased drug concentration, now the drug concentration might actually increase. So now let's say I have an increased drug concentration. Now, when I say allergy meds, I'm referring to the uh, antihistamines, the H1 blockers. And I'm just going to teach you a little pharmacology about the H1 blockers. One of the things that they do, these antihistamines, is they have something called anticholinergic side effects. And those anticholinergic side effects, that's right, anticholinergic, we'll talk about autonomic pharmacology in a second, but these anticholinergic side effects can cause dry mouth. Recently I saw a patient who had been taking uh, you know the over-the-counter sleeping pills which are antihistamines and she actually had uh, extreme constipation constipation and so the idea here is we have this herb drug interactions you can get side effects not just from starting an enzyme inducing medication but also from stopping it and if I had you know, reached a good dose with my allergy meds and then I all of a sudden stopped my St. John's wort, well over the next couple days, as the amount of enzyme induction decreased, the drug concentration would go up and I might get side effects from that allergy medication. So hopefully this makes sense and you see the importance of understanding enzyme inducers and enzyme induction in general. In the next lecture, we'll talk about competitive inhibitors.